Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert Sean Stevenson, and I'm so grateful for you tuning in with me today. I'm really pumped about this episode. We're doing a dedication this month to things that can help to improve our brain health. We've got another incredible guest. He actually is the New York Times bestselling author of Genius Foods and really focusing on foods that fuel our incredible brain. But today we're parlaying that into something even bigger beyond food and even beyond our brain health a little bit and looking at what's affecting our health overall. But truly, our brain is impacting every other aspect of our bodies. You know, it's just incredible regulating force, whether it's regulating our blood pressure, whether it's helping to regulate our hormone production, our sex hormones, whether it's helping to regulate our stress response, our, uh, our blood sugar, our brain plays a critical role in so many different things. Regulating what's happening with our digestive system. There's this intricate song and dance going on via our gut and our brain all the time. All right? It's amazing. It's amazing what it's uh, capable of doing in our lives. So we really want to focus on great brain health. And, you know, for me, it's the, the, the input isn't just from food. It's also from our experiences. And I had a really interesting experience today with my son, Brayden. He's eight years old. Uh, he's in second grade right now. And he came over to me this morning. He was like, Dad, why are bad words bad words? You know, these are words that we just make up what they mean. Why does it even matter? And I'm just like, bro, wait a minute, hold on. Like, I've thought about this same thing before on many occasions. It's trying to like mull over myself and process and meditate on wh what makes words so powerful. Why are these words deemed bad? Why are these words deemed okay to say? And so in that moment, I told him, number one, this is an incredible question. And you think like me, and I respect that, all right? You're special. You know, <laughs> a little DJ Khaled love, like you're loyal. I appreciate that. But also I told him that I think the context and when people say it's a bad word is because this word is deemed commonly agreed upon to be offensive to somebody. And I asked him, do you know what offensive means? And he said, uh, it's kind of, he started to like go into like a, a fighting stance. And I was like, yes, it's kind of like it's, it's, it's attacking somebody at some level. You know, but the reality is this, and the overall reality that I want him to understand, and for all of us to understand, is that words, they're so powerful because of the meaning that we give them. It's not the words, the meaning that we attach to the word, right? Words have associated feelings. Words have associated experiences. Words have associated uh, descriptions of certain things, right? If you say a word like couch, like there's going to be an image that comes attached to that. It's a whole different spectrum of potentialities for couches in your mind that's unique to everybody else. You might've thought about your couch when you got your first apartment, right? You might've thought about a couch you grew up on, you know, like your mom's couch with the plastic on it, all right? I don't know about you, I don't know, I don't think you probably grew up like that, like I did. My grandma, my grandma Ola Mae, she had plastic on her cushions, okay? Number one, you can't sit on it. Okay, for, but then like a certain amount of decades go by and you can't, right? But then if you do get to sit on, it's plastic wrap over the cushions. Not comfortable. And don't let you sit on it in the summertime when you got the short shorts, because we went to short shorts, we had short shorts first and then it transitioned to the long shorts, now we back to short shorts. But we had the short shorts and the plastic sticking to your legs, come on. Not cool, but it's all coming from a word, right? Words are powerful. And so what words are we imbibing? What words are we pulling in from the world around us and the things that we're reading, the things we're listening to? What words are we telling ourselves in the way that we speak to ourselves, in the way that we describe ourselves in circumstance and situations, right? Because every single word has meaning and your brain is absorbing it. Your brain is absorbing it. These commands that we give, you know, uh, every single moment of every day, the words that we're taking in that we're associating with are having an impact on us and our thinking and our experience in life. So I just wanted to share that little story and to plant that seed, to be aware of words and the power of words, and also to be aware of when the power of words goes too far and you let them control you, right? Because it is indeed just a word, right? So just so wanted to share that with you. And again, I think that you're absolutely gonna love this episode as we're diving in and talking more about brain health, talking about words. We got all the best words, all right? <laughs> 
But before we do that, I want to give a quick shout out to something that helps my brain to perform at its best level. And for me, it's really understanding that your brain is like the VIP section of your body. Okay. It's like if you go into the club and then they got the little, they got the velvet rope, right? Where they got that section that not everybody can get into. All right. That's what your brain section is in your body. It's that VIP section. Like you got to know somebody. You got to have some kind of exceptional value. You got to be on the list, right, to get into the brain. And with that said, with all the different things that we are able to take in via our nutrition and foods that we eat, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of different nutritive components, all the different antioxidants, uh, enzymes, all the different micronutrients, macros, all of these different components that we know about, there's only a few dozen that we know for sure get express VIP access into your brain itself because your brain, that velvet rope or the security, security that is there at the door of your brain is known as the blood brain barrier, right? It's a internal defense for things that are internal in your body and also external inputs as well. We need to have a guard up for that. But here's the thing, crossing past the VIP section, the blood brain barrier, only a handful of stuff can get in there to number one, nourish your brain, number two, to help to improve communication between your brain cells, right? These synaptic connections. And so the stuff that can get in there is of the utmost importance, but so many of us are actually deficient on things that can fuel our brain and fuel our performance, all right? One of the things that we know for certain that's able to cross the blood-brain barrier now, via two different actions is MCT oil. All right, we've got new data showing that MCTs, medium chain triglycerides, can cross into that VIP section of the brain and directly feed your brain cells and help to stimulate and support neurogenesis. All right, but also, MCTs have the ability to improve your cognitive function by increasing your body's production of ketones. Whether you're on a, a keto diet or you're fasting or not, Consuming high-quality MCT oil helps your body produce ketones like that, all right? So this is part of the reason why every day, today included, I make sure that I'm getting a high-quality source of MCT oil because there's a lot, like with anything, you know, marketers try to see something, they try to jump on it, and they water it down. That's not happening with the source that I get my MCT oil from. High-quality, sustainably sourced MCT oil. Plus, I love the emulsified MCT oil. It's beyond, you know, your great granddad's MCT oil. All right, the emulsified is like a coffee creamer. All right, it's delicious. You know, you can stir it in with, you know, with the with the utensil, versus you know, like if you're trying to mix in that oil, it doesn't combine. Right, the conventional MCT oil, which is fine. We can use those too. We can use those too for salad dressings. We can mix them in if you're going to blend it into something, into a smoothie, things like that. But or take it straight if you're a, a shot taker, you know. But uh, for me, I love the I love the experience of enjoying my nutrition, not just having something that's important for my body, but like I like to enjoy the process. And so that's why I'm a huge fan of the On It MCT oils. I'm a big fan. My favorite is the almond milk latte flavor. All right, so it's On It. That's O N N I T dot com forward slash model. And you get 10% off all their MCT oils, as well as all of their earth-grown nutrient-based supplements. Human performance. They're about optimal human performance. They've got fitness equipment as well. They just, they've been a, a, a real pioneer in the fitness equipment domain with the battle ropes and the, and the uh, primal bells, the steel clubs and maces. On it, push that into popular culture. All right, just a big shout out to them. So um, my wife's favorite is the vanilla. So many different flavors to choose from. They got savory MCT oils as well for salad dressings. So much good stuff there. Pop over there, check them out. It's onit.com forward slash model. That's O-N-N-I-T dot com forward slash model. Again, 10% off every single thing they carry. And on that note, let's get to the Apple Podcast Review of the Week. Another five-star review titled Binge It by Living and Thriving. Literally one of the two podcasts that I could binge all day. Sean's voice is soothing and smooth as butter while delivering relevant and scientifically backed health and wellness knowledge bombs. Grateful for Sean and all his guests on the show for educating me and giving me the tools to build a fuller and healthier life. I've fallen in love with keeping me and my family happy, fed right, and active thanks to you all. Keep bringing the heat. 
Thank you so much. And I absolutely will continue to do that. Keep bringing that heat. Thank you so much for leaving that review over on Apple Podcasts. If you've yet to do so, please pop over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review for the show. You have no idea how much that matters to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And on that note, let's get to our special guest and topic of the day. Today's guest is Max Lugavere, who's a filmmaker, health and science journalist, and the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Genius Foods. Max is also a frequent guest on some of the biggest major media shows out there, including Dr. Oz, The Rachel Ray Show, The Doctors, and more. He's also contributed to Medscape, Vice, Fast Company, CNN, and The Daily Beast. He's been featured in NBC Nightly News, The Today Show, and in The Wall Street Journal. And now he's back to talk about a step up from just genius foods, but also how to live a genius life. So let's jump into this epic conversation with Max Lukavir. Every A lot of people talking about intermittent fasting, but mm. you went in like people just by putting it into this window, same amount of calories, you know, <laughs> I think it was a, a mouse study though, but you know what I mean? It's just like, that is mind blowing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So of course I talk about that, uh, the calorie issue, you know, there's a lot of parallels. And I think again, like, some of these things are really going to rise to the top right now. I think your book is one of those. Dude, well, you know. I mean, yeah, as I said, coming coming from you, that's like, that's amazing. I mean, I, it's it's a response, I think, in many ways to um, what was going on in my life while I was writing it and also the kinds of things that I see on social media. Um, you know, we see this obsession with calorie counting, with macros and things like that. I mean, you, you know, just as well as anybody, like... Um, that there's, there are definitely people who are willing to become obsessed with these kinds of things, mm -hmm. but I just don't think that that is the key to, you know, ultimate health and, and happiness and uh, and even sustainable weight loss. Yeah. It's uh, so yeah so yeah I kind of just try to give people tips that they can use that are going to make things um, practical and easy and without having to like become obsessed over esoteric artifacts like calories and things like that not that they don't matter but yeah. they you know it's just it's one component you know but we can become calorie obsessed obviously i've got a friend who's like a, a weight loss doctor you know like very famous one and he's just all you know the calories like if you just cut the calories then this and that you know but the reality is it's such a bigger story and calories were actually they were invented for physics, not even for nutrition. You yeah. know, like it's like it kind of fell into this thing, and you got to th even think about th the foods that we eat when we're out, packaged foods, things like that. These are gross estimates at best. Mm -hmm. You know, what I mean? just like when you're getting on a treadmill and it's telling you it just burned, you know, 120 calories, kinda. You know what I mean? But so, what are some of those pieces that we can kind of get a little bit that we need a little bit more focus on? One of the things you talk about in the book is like the um, hyper palatable foods like food being a certain way causing you to eat more of those calories for example Let's yeah talk about that yeah for sure i mean here's the th here's the thing about telling people like calorie counting obviously is going to work you need to be at a calorie deficit to lose weight like i'm not refuting the calories in calories out model of obesity right but telling somebody that their weight ultimately comes down to the amount of calories they're consuming is just like saying, if you came to me and you were like, Max, how do I get rich? It's like, you know, it's, it's the equivalent of saying, um, earn more than you spend. That's it. But it doesn't tell a person anything about how to save money, how to make money, anything like that. It's just very poor advice. Um, so what I offer in, in the book is sort of like how to get rich. And, and how to make more money and how to save more money um, without really having to become obsessed and, and, and let it rule your life. So I'm glad you brought up hyperpalatable foods. I think this is a huge topic. I liken it to mouth porn, um, essentially. You're seeing a lot of people who are uh, actually becoming addicted to pornography today due to the fact that it's just ever present on the internet and, and super accessible. The same thing could be said for ultra processed convenient food, convenience foods. They're always at arm's length today. And this is one of the reasons why your average person is eating for 16 hours over the course of the day. From the minute they wake up in the morning to the just before they go to sleep, they are consuming and metabolizing food. Um, so the proximity issue is one thing. And the other issue, which we now know thanks to data, which wasn't even you know available to us when I had written my first book, that ultra processed foods 
um, cause you to overeat them. We know, thanks to a study at the National Institutes of Health, that when you base your diet around ultra-processed foods, which I'm not just speaking in, in abstract, like this is 60% of the calories that most people consume today come from ultra-processed foods, that it becomes exponentially more difficult to control your hunger. Um, and this is a, to a, a pretty profound degree. People actually will end up consuming, over-consuming about 500 additional c- calories every day. Uh, when they build, when they base their diets around these ultra-processed foods, and in, conversely, if you stick to primarily whole foods, your hunger self-regulates, and you actually come in at a calorie deficit effortlessly. And in in that study, both times, both on the ultra-processed foods diet and the whole foods diet, um, the subjects were eating to satiety, yeah. so they were eating to fullness. They were eating until the point at which they were like, "All right, I've had enough." Incredible. Uh, one of the things that you talk about is that. The, the process of digestion itself hmm. burns calories is one of the things that we really don't think about in the context of eating foods. So how does that compare if we're eating a processed food? You know, maybe it's just, um, you know, I don't know why this is jumping in my mind, but Funyuns, yeah. you know, a bag of Funyuns versus uh, a bag of raw almonds. Yeah, man, all the, all, that's why I love talking to you because you ask all the best questions. I was, I, w- I was hoping that I would get to bring this up because this is another new study. Um, so yeah, I mean, digestion is crucially important, uh, obviously to assimilate and, and absorb nutrients from our food, but it also, how we digest these foods dictates to a large degree, the amount of energy that we're absorbing from them. And when you're eating ultra processed foods, uh, like Funyuns, um, like ice cream, like commercially produced breads, you can be, um, certain that you are absorbing 100% of the calories that you consume. When you're eating whole foods, you actually, a significant portion of the calories that you might even read on the serving size of the, of the nutrition facts label, a significant portion of those calories are actually not even getting digested. They're passing through you. Um, this was recently revealed in a USDA study where they looked at whole nuts and they found that a significant, like almost 30% of the calories that were previously thought not, you know, that nuts had contained um, we're just going undigested through the digestive tract. And they did this uh, study, kind of gross, but of course needed to be done, um, where they looked at the, the, the residual calories in the stool of subjects after they ate whole nuts. And they found that, you know, a, lot, a significant amount of these calories aren't even being digested because they're a whole food. And, um, you know, there are particles that go undigested and remain undigested through the, through the GI tract. But then you take a food like nut butter, like almond butter, peanut butter, which is a processed food, right? It's basically pre-digested and you're absorbing 100% of those calories. So by sticking to whole foods, yeah, I mean, your hunger is gonna gonna automatically regulate itself. You're gonna digest probably a significant fewer amount of calories, uh, you know, which, which is another reason why calorie counting, I don't think is the best solution because there's such a wide margin of error that calorie counting um, is subject to. And then there's of course, what's called the thermic effect of feeding. And so certain foods have a higher thermic effect than others, meaning that your body is going to burn energy. It's going to burn off calories just digesting the food alone without you having to do anything other than eat it. And high protein foods are going to have the highest thermic effect, high protein whole foods. And the lowest thermic effect are going to come from, can you guess, ultra processed foods. And that's because whole foods burn about twice uh, the calories just via digestion alone, um, as, as ultra processed foods. And when it comes to macronutrient composition, ultra processed foods are primarily going to be, they're primarily constituted of carbs and fat, right? Carbs and fat are that sort of ultra palatable, um, you know, it just lends a really great mouthfeel, uh, it sends our, our dopamine, you know, reward centers in the brain. Like, you know, it's like the 4th of July fireworks when we eat foods that combine, usually sugar and fat. Um, but people might know that fat has nine calories per gram, carbohydrates and protein have four calories per gram. But actually, when you look at the thermic effect of um, these macronutrients, protein actually has three calories per gram because a third of the protein calories that you consume get burned off. Mm. So you're actually at, a, you're getting a bit of a metabolic advantage by prioritizing protein. And that's one of the dietary recommendations that I make in the genius life, I go sort of big on protein, um, which is something that, you know, people in the fitness community have known the value of protein, but I think the population at large um, has kind of gotten a little bit confused about the value of protein because 
you hear things in the media all the time, like we're eating too much protein, protein's not good for you, it's bad for your kidneys, none of which is actually true. And uh, I think as a, as a tool to satiate your hunger, protein is the most satiating macronutrient and that, that caloric advantage that you get. Um, I think that's one of the, I think, uh, more practical recommendations that I make for in terms of diet that just by focusing on protein, prioritizing protein, most people will experience a spontaneous weight loss, especially if you're eating a low protein diet. Yeah, yeah, it's so powerful, man. It's doing so many different, different things like the thermic effect, but also, you know, it's this essential, it's a building block for communication in your body, you know, your hormones, your neurotransmitters, so many benefits. And man, I'm so glad that you brought this up. This is something, again, I've been really talking about and thinking about and wanting to press in the popular culture because there's a lot of infighting with the carbs and fats and uh, protein sitting over here like, I get no respect, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's it's so important. It's such a powerful fuel. But I think that even going back a little bit and talking about the public perception, which is we're eating too much protein. And one of the reasons is like we see is processed meats, for example. You know, you'll see the commercial with the KC, the KFC stacker. Yeah. Like you got the fried chicken bun, right? Each bun is a chicken. And then it's like a, I think it's like a burger or something in the middle with like the bacon. I don't know. Oh, it's just man. like, yeah, I mean, that, yeah. But <laughs> then we have just, how folks have evolved, you know what I'm saying? And no matter which place we look in the blue zones all over the world, we're seeing a, a source of protein coming in into play, but we're not talking about it enough, you know? So I'm so glad you brought that up. But I wanna go back and talk about um, that driving force when you talk about sugar and fat coming together. And so for me, it's like, and I know you grew up much the same way, it's like egos, you yeah. know, let go of my ego, yeah. you know, with some butter on there, you got the Pop-Tarts, you've got, you know, all these different, uh, snack cakes and cookies and all these different things when you combine these together and you offer up a great tip in the book and just like put a potato in the oven so can you share that example yeah exactly I mean you can see you can see the 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 nature of hyper palatability at work if you just do this little thought experiment you can actually do it in your kitchen if you have a baked potato around um, but if you were to bake a potato a plain baked potato uh, you probably wouldn't be inclined to overconsume that potato. I mean, maybe you'll take a few mouthfuls, but it's really not going to be all that palatable. Uh, interestingly enough, potatoes are, are pretty satiating, um, but they're just not. I think that the reason for that is that they're not very good. People don't really want to eat much more, you know, after just a few uh, forkfuls. But if you take that same baked potato and then you add fat to it, like let's say some grass-fed butter, which you know I've certainly indulged in a, in a baked potato with grass-fed butter. You're adding fat to it, then you put some salt on it. Suddenly that baked potato, the combination of those three elements makes, the, makes it hyper palatable. You know, you're gonna wanna eat the whole thing. You might even go back for seconds. But the baked potato by itself, not all that palatable. Yeah. The butter by itself, not all that, I mean, nobody's walking around eating sticks of butter, right? Um, well. Maybe Dave Asprey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the salt, you know? Um, and that's another thing like that a lot of people will say that sugar is addictive. I think that statement requires a little bit of, um, you know, investigation as well, because it's not like you see people mainlining pure sugar necessarily, but it's the combination of all those things yeah. that uh, really trips up your brain's satiety checkpoints and hunger checkpoints. And um, it's at the root cause, I think, of the modern obesity epidemic where by the year 2050, one in two adults are going to be obese, which is just insane to, to consider. Crazy, man. Crazy. So your book, so Genius Foods first book. Yeah. That's really the focus on food, nutrition. This is the genius life in this book. And you're traversing into other domains that help to create an overall healthy, sovereign human being. And one of the things you highlight, and just to talk a little bit about the food a little bit more, but it's not just the food, but also when you eat. Mm -hmm. And so you brought up some of the incredible data and we're talking about um, you know, things like intermittent fasting, but just overall fasting in general. And so I wanna talk about uh, the mTOR. I wanna talk a little bit about mTOR and how that uh, plays into things when we're talking about fasting, longevity, and uh, AMPK, I like AMPK. Yeah, AMPK, yeah. I mean, this is so cool. This is the first time I've been asked about these actually. Um, so basically these are uh, two of your body's chief nutrient sensors. So it's sort of like a thermostat that your body uses for lack of a better term that um, your body knows that your body uses to gauge 
um, nutrient status in the body, nutrient and energy, nutrient status, energy availability, things like that. Um, for an organism, energy availability is a very pressing concern. Are you going to have enough energy available to navigate the world, to procure food, to procreate, um, and ultimately to survive? So your body has these nutrient sensors. Um, AMPK is one of them. mTOR is another one of them. mTOR is primarily sensitive to dietary protein, and in particular, uh, an amino acid called leucine. Um, leucine is not uh, bad or good, but it is the most anabolic um, or growth promoting of the amino acids. So anybody who's ever been interested in bodybuilding or fitness knows that you need to get adequate leucine to grow muscle and to get strong. Um, but you know, mTOR activation, which occurs when we consume leucine, also has a dark side. Too much mTOR activation um, is thought to underlie um, the growth of uh, tumors yeah. and, and, and cancer things, uh, things like that. AMPK is sort of a, a nutrient sensor that gauges the overall energy availability in the body. Um, and how this works, it's pretty interesting. So the chief uh, energy currency of cells is um, ATP. And when ATP gets used up, it basically becomes AMP, which is uh, sort of like an energy depleted form of ATP. And when there's a lot of- I like it, I think of AMP, kinda. AMP. That's just how I think of it. AMP, kinda, <laughs> yeah. Um, but essentially when too much AMP builds up in the cell, yeah. That's a sign that there's not enough energy, right? And so it activates AMP um, kinase, which is a, a, a pathway, it's a protein um, that basically sends a signal that there's not enough energy around. We need to, we need to create more energy. So it actually um, encourages the burning of fat, the burning of sugar. It's basically just like a land grab for energy uh, when AMPK is activated. And it also helps to create new mitochondria. So it boosts insulin sensitivity. It, is um, one of the uh, pathways responsible for mitochondrial biogenesis, which is the creation of healthy new mitochondria. And the way to activate AMPK, which is thought to be this longevity pathway, also um, uh, metformin, the diabetes drug metformin activates AMPK. And this is one of the reasons why metformin is being looked at as a potential uh, you know, fasting mimetic, a, a longevity promoting drug. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, recommend metformin because studies have shown that it can reduce the benefits associated with exercise. Um, but nonetheless, so AMPK is this like this generally very beneficial thing, and it's thought to underlie the mechanism by which calorie restriction seems to be one of the most reliable ways to extend lifespan in smaller organisms. So you restrict calories, AMPK becomes activated because of that deficit of energy. You can also activate AMPK, AMPK with high intensity exercise. Because what you're doing when you're doing high intensity interval training, for example, like getting on that assault bike or swinging the battle ropes or even with resistance training, you're creating a momentary energy crisis in your muscle cells that are like, oh my God, we, you know, there's not enough energy around. If we don't generate enough energy, we're not going to survive, right? Yeah. And so AMPK activates, um, mTOR is suppressed. And, uh, and so it's, you know, those are the two mechanisms by which exercise is uh, and calorie restriction are meant to really be beneficial for the body. And um, these are also the, the proposed mechanisms by which intermittent fasting is supposed to work. So when we intermittent fast, you know, for a time we're depriving the body of energy, we're depriving the body of protein. Um, and so what you get is an upregulation of AMPK, a downregulation of mTOR, and both of these um, f facts are thought to um, be longevity promoting. They're thought to reduce cancer incidence. Also, mTOR um, suppression is what drives, uh, or one of the factors that drives autophagy, which is what I call like the Kondo, the the KonMari method for biology. You know, Marie Kondo. It's like she's all about tidying up. So yeah. that's how your cells actually tidy up. They clean out uh, worn out dysfunctional proteins and organelles and things like that. And so when you calorie restrict, when you intermittent fast, when you do high intensity uh, exercise, you're basically activating all of those wonderful pathways. And the beautiful thing about exercise and intermittent fasting and calorie restriction is that unlike drugs like, say, metformin, which I mentioned earlier, you know, these phar pharmaceuticals really work on singular biological pathways or chemicals. Um, exercise, calorie restriction, intermittent fasting works the whole system out. And, you know, it just, it's so evolutionarily, um, it makes so much sense, you know, and, it, and it's so comprehensive in terms of its effect on the body. 
Um, that's why I think, you know, these sort of lifestyle um, interventions should always be a first line of defense against uh, the diseases of aging and even aging itself. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree, man. Um, I was really surprised to see such a big focus on what I'm about to ask you about, but I was, it was pleasantly surprised. And it's the chapter on the vigor trigger, Yeah. right? So number one, can you share what that is? Yeah. And, and number two, why did you feel it was uh, a necessity to like highlight this in depth like you did in this book? Yeah, so the vigor trigger, it's what I call the chapter where I cover all things nature. Um, and this isn't just, you know, going out into the woods hippy dippy style. I talk about the value of getting sun on your skin, um, the value of exposing your body to variation in ambient temperature, uh, just getting out into nature and being around greenery. Um, there's just so many benefits associated with nature bathing. Uh, they're doing a lot of this research in Japan, but you know, the, the benefits have become so uh, obvious and so clear that now, you know, uh, various universities and academic centers are studying how nature exposure can uh, reduce cortisol, reduce anxiety, depression, things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, there's that saying, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. And today we've become, we've, we've built these environments around us that we've created to ultimately coddle us, you know, whether it's the chronic climate control that we're exposed to. Um, or the fact that the Environmental Working Group estimates that we spend 93% of our time indoors, out of the sun. Um, there's just a lot that we've lost touch with. And so in that chapter, I talk about a few things. I talk about, for one, the, 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 the value of getting vitamin D, of optimizing your vitamin D levels. Um, so vitamin D is a steroid hormone that essentially uh, controls the expression of a thousand genes in the body, at mm -hmm. least, which is 5% of the human genome. Um, and it's important for keeping inflammation in check, keeping your blood pressure healthy, um, promoting arterial flexibility, which is the ability of your arteries to expand and contract in accordance with the needs of, uh, you know, of, of, your, of the organism as it navigates the environment. Um, it's also uh, being looked at now as a way of both preventing and treating autoimmunity. Um, there's this really interesting study that found that children who were born um, during the uh, summer months, um, meaning that women were likely had a higher, I think it was actually babies born in the winter months, meaning that women were spent most of their time pregnant in the summer months, so that they were having, so that they had higher levels of vitamin D. Mm. Ultimately, end up ended up having lower risk of multiple sclerosis mm. or MS. And vitamin D is actually the only. A vitamin supplement where there's really a strong body of evidence now saying that vitamin D can potentially help as a therapeutic tool for sufferers of um, of MS. Oh man, I've seen even uh, so MS, but I've also seen rickets. Like literally, somebody comes in their child into my office, rickets. You know, just like they can walk over a tumbleweed. You mm -hmm. know, like their legs are so bowed. Vitamin D, man. I mean, wow. legs are amazing today. Yeah, vitamin D is important. I mean, people people think about it really in terms of bone health and being able to prevent rickets. Um, but it really, it's important for so many things. I mean, there are vitamin D receptors in cells in every organ of your body. Um, it's important for uh, reducing inflammation in the brain. In fact, there was a very interesting small study needs to be replicated, but they found that the mere supplementation with 800 international units of vitamin D per day in patients with, I believe it was Alzheimer's disease or a, a mild form of Alzheimer's disease, the, just the supplement, it was a randomized placebo-controlled trial found that vitamin D supplementation was able to essentially halt the progress of the disease um, for a time. So again, small study. I wouldn't, um, you know, uh, take that as gospel at this point. But, um, but yeah, I mean, we know that vitamin D is good for us. Yeah. So what do we do? Do we go out and just swipe down the store shelves of vitamin D? What is the optimal way to get our levels right? I think you want to spend more time in the sun. Yeah. So when our skin is exposed to the UVB rays from the sun, our skin creates vitamin D uh, or a precursor to the active hormone in the body, and then it has to be converted in the kidneys and the liver to the active hormone form. Um, what I think most people don't realize about vitamin D, which was surprising and something that I discovered while writing the book, is that the enzymes that activate vitamin D in the body require magnesium. 
mm-hmm. and 50 percent of the population does not consume adequate magnesium so what that means is that you might be supplementing with vitamin d you might be spending time in the sun maybe even spending too much time in the sun burning um, and you might not actually see your vitamin d levels budge on labs until you start consuming more magnesium so i'm actually a huge fan of magnesium i talk about that in the book one of the primary drivers of aging it's been posited is dna damage and dna damage is also at the root cause of cancer and we have an ability in our bodies to repair uh, against dna damage Um, but all of the dna damage all of the dna repair enzymes require magnesium Mm -hmm. Um, so again like magnesium is like this amazing thing we require it to create atp which is energy if you're not consuming adequate magnesium you're not going to be generating the energy that you know your body uh, is capable of generating. You're not going to be repairing uh, against DNA damage to your full capacity, um, and you're also not going to be creating vitamin D uh, yeah. effectively. So now the big question, you know, and, and I totally agree with you. Like, this is something we humans evolved getting access to sunlight. Now we're spending ninety three percent of our time indoors on average, which is crazy. Yeah. And we've created this fear of the sun. And truthfully, sun can hurt you, but it's for many people, it's you need more. You need more than the, the fear um, kind of construct has created. Now, with that said, what about folks that you moved from New York, right? Yeah. You grew up in New York, right? I grew up in New York City, yeah. And then you, of course, like you're out here now, it's Cali sunny, but what about folks in, in NYC? What about folks in New England? What yeah. about folks in, you know, Halifax, Canada? What do we do in the winter months? That's a good question. It's funny. I, did, I moved out here and somehow I still look like you're staring into a tube of Elmer's glue. Like <laughs> I, I need to get that. I need to practice what I preach is what, uh, is what I'm starting to think. Um, well... So vitamin D, uh, you need to, I think the best way to get it is from the sun because the sun, you're not just getting vitamin D, you're getting a boost in nitric oxide, which occurs when our skin is exposed to the UVA rays from the sun. You're also getting adequate bright light to anchor your body's circadian rhythm, which I talk a lot about in the book um, and the value of that. Um, But yeah, there, there obviously is variation in our capacity to synthesize vitamin D if you're Um, older, you need to spend more time in the sun compared to when you're younger, you become less efficient at creating vitamin D, um, in advanced age, uh, compared to younger people. If you have a darker complexion, you need to spend more time in the sun. Melanin is nature's sunscreen, you know? So even though, uh, you know, people with darker skin color might actually look better as they age, um, they still need to get, they need to really be uh, conscious of vitamin D and spending more time in the sun. Um, people who are overweight actually need to spend more time in the sun than their thin counterparts because uh, vitamin D, like vitamin E, A, and K, is a fat-soluble vitamin. It gets sequestered by fat tissue. So if, you're, if you've are if you got some weight on you, um, you got to spend more time in the sun. That being said, you don't want to burn. But, um, but yeah, time in the sun, I think, is crucial. Now, because there's also seasonal variation, uh, that's where I think eating foods that are high in vitamin D can come in to uh, help get you to the next, you know, time at which you can get out into the sun. And so fatty, oily fish, uh, cold water fish, um, egg yolks, great source of vitamin D, a significant source of vitamin D um, through the diet. And then also we can store a little bit in our fat tissue as well. Yeah, that's a little bit of an insurance. You know, you can store some, you know, so those months that you can get adequate sun exposure, um, you can store it up so you don't have to be neurotic, but at the same time, incorporating those foods maybe some high quality supplementation for those that need it. It's such an important nutrient. Um, like you said, it's a, this is a steroid hormone, yeah. you know, but so with that said, also, we want to do this as natural as possible, let our body kind of figure it out and get sunlight. So what's the best way about getting the sunlight exposure? Just like, um, arms being out in your shirt, going out for a walk, um, shirt off, you know, there's some research with getting some sun on, uh, lay sack, it can help to boost testosterone. I've heard that, yeah. Now, what about, so are we saying, so like get some on your, you know, your back. Yeah. What about the butthole tanning? Oh, Max? man, Max. I've seen that, yeah. So many of our friends even like, you know, taking the pictures, you know, the butthole tanning. I know, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> Actually, one of the guys who uh, who really made it popular, I know him. He lives in West Hollywood. His name is Ra. I've had him on my podcast. No way is we, his name Ra. His name is Ra what of Earth. <laughs> And uh, I've had him on my show. We talk all about butthole sunning. 
Um, I forget which episode it is, but it's there. Uh, the genius life. And, um, but yeah, it's a thing. You know what? There's a lot of people in the, in the evidence based, um, camp that like, will will poo poo, no pun intended, uh, that, that whole practice. But you know what? Like if you enjoy the way that it feels, uh, do it. I mean, you're still gonna be creating vitamin D down there. Is there any magical thing that's going to happen by exposing your butthole to the sun? I don't think so. I mean, the sun is a powerful disinfectant. So maybe, yeah. you know, maybe there's some truth there that, uh, this ancient wisdom, they found that it was a good way to clean up somehow, you know, with the sun. But, dude, I don't know. I think generally if you're – the more surface area you can expose to the sun, the better. Now, there, you're still – like the sun can still photo age you. So um, if you're going to spend, uh, you know, an excessive amount of time in the sun, um, you know, you might want to put some sunblock on your face. You might want to um, – if you're if you're going on vacation and you think that you might end up burning, which is not good, um, you know sunblock. I talk all about uh, chemical sunblocks in the book and how you want to avoid those. So if you are going to go for a sunblock, I always recommend like a zinc oxide, like a mineral-based sunscreen. And I'm also a huge fan of a supplement called astaxanthin, which is a, a marine carotenoid. It's found in wild salmon um, and crustaceans and uh, it actually acts like a sunscreen from the inside out. So I always, I take astaxanthin every single day, but I um, also will kind of like double down if I know that I've got like a trip to the tropics coming up or something like that. Fascinating. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Krill is like the big source. Krill's great. Um, for the astaxanthin. Um, so, wow, that's great stuff. So we got vitamin D um, and you also mentioned magnesium. So let's hit on just a couple of foods for people to target with magnesium. And also, what about supplementation? Yeah. So foods that are high in magnesium, I always prefer getting my, my minerals from food, but magnesium is sort of an exception that I make. I, I'll supplement with magnesium. I take magnesium glycinate, um, which is magnesium bound to glycine. It doesn't, it's not going to upset your stomach. If you take too much magnesium citrate, which is a cheaper form of it, it might give you diarrhea because it brings, it draws water into the gut. Um, so I'll take, uh, I'll take that. But generally, foods that are high in magnesium, you can't beat pumpkin seeds. They're a very high source, very rich source. Uh, uh, dark chocolate is actually a great source. Um, almonds are a wonderful source. And I just learned this today, actually, that uh, Brazil nuts are also a fantastic source. Mm -hmm. And when you eat either either of those four foods, you're getting with them a ton of other micronutrients. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of dark chocolate. It's great for the brain, great for the cardiovascular system. Um, almonds are rich in vitamin E, which is, you know, a, a wonderful protector molecule for the brain. Um, Brazil nuts are rich in selenium, which is a, a, a great protector molecule for the brain as well. So, um, yeah, you really can't go wrong. Magnesium is, yeah, it's important. And again, half of the population doesn't consume adequate amounts of it. It's, it's actually like a, it's a, it's like a longevity supplement yeah. in a way, I think. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Um, it, it's so funny that and you just mentioned in food, when you're eating food, you're getting all of this other stuff. Yeah. You know, and I, you can't help but have the realization that it probably helps absorption. It probably helps your body to use it more intelligently when it's packaged with these different um, phytonutrients that are coming along with the magnesium. You know what I mean? Versus the isolated thing, which this is the one thing too. In my practice, when people would come in, this was the one supplement that I kind of consistently got people to take in addition to the nutrition changes was magnesium just because it's such an important thing man and so i'm so glad that you brought it up and you highlighted it in the book but you also when you were talking a little bit earlier about the butthole tanning <laughs> just to go back a little bit yeah let's go back you also mentioned um sunscreen right which that was a is a bad transition there, but <laughs> sunscreen is one of those sources potentially i saw some research years ago i haven't looked at it in a while but finding that folks using certain sunscreens and certain compounds in sunscreens being carcinogens that lead to cancer hmm. and you have a chapter in here focused on uh, toxic world yes all right so let's talk a little bit about that what what are some of the things that we need to be aware of when we're dealing with this very new environment for our human genes to be exposed to. Yeah, so that's a chapter where I try my best not to fear monger. I just, uh, you know, and, I, and not to make alarmist claims, but I think it's, it's very important for people to become aware of the different compounds that they are exposed to on a chronic basis that may be having a profound effect on their health without them even knowing it mm. um, or consenting to it. And, uh, and so sunscreen is one of those things where, you know, recent studies, very, very recent studies have been performed finding that 
Um, when we slather our bodies with these chemical drugstore sunscreens in accordance with the instructions on the on the package that they are actually able to enter circu- circulation at a, at, a, at a concentration far higher than um, was previously thought. And the, and the levels at which they're able to reach in the body is even above the FDA's threshold for toxicological concern. And these compounds include avobenzone, oxybenzone. Oxybenzone is a potential endocrine disruptor, meaning it can mess with your system of hormones that guide everything from your risk for dis- certain diseases, um, fat storage, uh, brain function, and if you're younger, development. So that's a, a chapter where I, I really go deep into the science of endocrine disruption. Um, and I talk about some of the more common um, uh, proposed endocrine disruptors. But what's so tricky about anything that's going to um, artificially mess with your hormones is that, you know, at different points along the age spectrum, they could either have uh, undesirable effects or they can have you know, and temporary effects, or they can have potentially lifelong effects. So I just want people to think more, uh, you know, critically the next time they take these drugstore chemicals and they slather their children on, you know, they slather them on their children. Um, Oxybenzone, as I mentioned, you know, may be a, a potent endocrine disruptor. And also these compounds actually are able to transform into other potentially even more dangerous compounds um, when exposed to chemicals in pool water. This was recently revealed. So it's just like, it's a mad world that we're living in. And I don't like to give these compounds the benefit of the doubt. Um, The stance that I take in the book uh, is that we should consider them guilty until proven innocent. And they really haven't been proven innocent. You know, a lot of the time these chemicals um, will be sort of foisted into the, you know, onto the human population, allowed to enter the marketplace before appropriate testing has been done. Like I'm not, I really don't know why it was now that we found out about this. You know, the fact that these chemicals are to such a high concentration, able to enter circulation and, um, and, uh, and what the, I mean, what the, what the downstream effects of that are going to be. Like, we just don't know. So people should just definitely be more skeptical. I talk a lot about plastic related compounds like BPA and phthalates. Phthalates are, um, anytime you'll see a soft plastic, like a, a, a disposable water bottle, um, they're also used in fragrances. So synthetic fragrances are made using phthalates. Um, and then we have BPA, which is used to make hard plastic. So you'll see BPA typically in the lining of cans. Um, you'll see it in reusable water bottles. Um, Consumers have become aware of BPA at this point, and so it's led to a lot of manufacturers removing BPA and replacing BPA. Where with... did BPA start? Oh, man, BPA started. This is an interesting story. So BPA, actually, it originally was developed as a, uh, a pharmaceutical because BPA possesses profound um, estrogenic-like activity in the body. It's known as a xenoestrogen. Um, so in the body, what it does is it will mimic estrogen or it'll uh, basically... It'll affect how estrogen functions, which is the primary female sex hormone, but men have estrogen, you know, to a much smaller degree in their bodies as well. Um, and, uh, and so it was actually designed to be a medicine um, back in the day. I mean, this was in, I believe, the 1930s uh, was when the estrogenic um, properties of BPA were first identified uh, in London by um, a professor named uh, Edward Dodds, I think his name was. And what happened was, ultimately, they discovered a a different compound called diethylstilbestrol, or DES. And DES actually had uh, way higher estrogenic um, potential compared to BPA. And so DES actually um, got approved for use as a drug. They started using it to give to women to alleviate symptoms of menopause and premenstrual syndrome. They were just injecting it into women, like millions millions of women. They also started to give it to livestock to increase uh, milk production, to um, promote growth. And what, uh, like, is so often the case, um, maybe not often, but is so frequently the case, uh, what they ended up ultimately finding was that girls born to women who were injected with DES ended up having uh, all kinds of vaginal cancers, um, cervical cancer, and things like that. And so DES was basically just a a much more powerful form of BPA. But BPA and DES, they're chemically related. BPA was never actually approved for uh, use as a pharmaceutical, but instead they realized that it could be used to make hard plastics. 
And this was at a time when um, it was like the, the, the 50s when, you know, the American dream really was starting to become crystallized in the minds of consumers. And suddenly we could fill our homes with, you know, plastics, uh, plastic furniture, um, plastic cutlery. It was it just seemed like this miracle compound, right? You could do anything with it. It was heat resistant. It was sanitary. It was safe um, in air quotes. And that's uh, I use air quotes to say safe because. For the longest time, BPA was thought to be inert. It was just going to, it would be, it could be used to create plastic, but that it was going to ultimately stay there. And what we now know is that BPA is able to leach into the foods and beverages that are stored into compounds made with BPA and also chemically similar uh, compounds, newer compounds like BPS and BPF um, that are being used to replace BPA. But there's no reason to suspect that they're going to be any safer than BPA. And BPA also. Um, because it's used in things like furniture and electronics and the like, uh, actually is able to slough off and, and uh, create dust that we then inhale. So it's literally everywhere. It's one of these chemicals um, that you'll just find in drinking water all over the United States. 99% of, or 97% of human beings have measurable amounts of BPA in their blood. Um, it's just, it's one of these uh, everywhere chemicals. Yeah. A major source of BPA is actually um, store register receipts. So if you go to a store and you get a receipt and it's uh, a thermally sensitive paper, you can always tell. I mean, they have a certain feel to them. They feel kind of dusty, but you can write on them with your fingernail. Those papers are coated with BPA. And um, and actually, it's what's interesting is that if you use a they've another study has found that if you use a hand sanitizer before touching these receipts, it dramatically increases your exposure to BPA. The the hand sanitizer basically makes your skin a lot more sensitive and permeable to environmental toxins. Yeah, it's a solvent. Yeah. So. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's crazy. And so just think about all the people who are doing that, right? All the all the cash register clerks, they're like already making minimum wage, stuck in jobs that are probably not what they had envisioned for themselves as children, right? But then they're touching these compounds that are just keeping them, uh, you know, not at their most optimal. We'll just say that. Um, and then we get handed these receipts and then we, you know, we hold the hands of our children. And children, as I mentioned, are particularly sensitive to these compounds because you know, these are endocrine disruptors. Yeah. Um, First of all, who's still getting receipts? You know, yeah. like they ask you, you know, do you want a receipt or uh, would you like to email the receipt? You know, it's just silly, but it's these micro exposures, like you're saying. And I love that you outline so many micro exposures that we're not aware of. And it creates this huge conglomeration. Burden. Of, yeah. Yeah. Burden, burden of toxicity. Yeah. And and to be clear, the doses at which we're exposed to, I mean, they are having effects in the body. There have been a number of studies that have found that they can alter insulin responses. Um, they can, uh, yeah, I mean, they, they, act like, they act like estrogen. And the thing that I also talk about in that chapter, which I think people need to know, is that what you'll, you'll often hear from the evidence-based, and I use air quotes, camp, um, people who are just uh, really, um, you know, not open-minded to the idea that these compounds can have uh, deleterious effects on human health, um, they'll often say that the dose makes the poison. You know, the dose we're getting is very low. It's been, you know, thought to be safe. But the dose makes the poison, I think, works for most, the vast majority of toxins, right? But what makes endocrine disruptors like BPA and phthalates um, particularly treacherous is that they don't necessarily always follow that dose makes the poison paradigm. Mm -hmm. There is what uh, researchers refer to as low dose toxicity or non monotonicity. So basically, the dose makes the poison implies that with increasing dose, uh, you know, any compound is going to become increasingly toxic, increasingly dangerous, and that nothing is really implicitly toxic. It's all about the dose. Um, you drink enough water too fast, some, somehow suddenly water becomes toxic. The problem is um, that these endocrine disruptors. Um, it's suspected that they don't actually follow that 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 nice and convenient linear curve that they can actually become uh, they can actually have an effect in the body uh, a completely different effect than they would have had at a high dose at a very low dose and that's one of the reasons why I think these compounds have been able to kind of uh, escape political and scientific scrutiny because they're just so hard to study and predict and they might have different effects on different people at different times in people in their lives yeah yeah that's so important to understand it's all case dependent, person dependent, even time of your life dependent. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about how to 
limit our toxic exposure, our toxin exposure, and also uh, some of the most important things in the book we're talking about really garnering peace of mind and how important that is for genius life. We're gonna do that right after this quick break, so sit tight, we'll be right back. Growing up, if I thought about chocolate, I think about Three Musketeers, I think about a Kit Kat, Butterfinger, right? I had all these ideas, hot chocolate, uh, chocolate ice cream, chocolate cake, those are the things that would conjure up in my mind when I thought about chocolate. Little did I know that chocolate itself, the original root of chocolate, which comes from something that's botanically a, a seed, these cacao seeds was one of the most healthy foods in the world. Listen to this. This was from a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition found that polyphenol-rich cacao or cocoa without the sugar, has remarkable prebiotic effects on the human body. So what the study found was that folks who were consuming this sugar-free cacao flavanol drink for four weeks significantly increased their ratio of probiotics or friendly bacteria, bifidobacteria, for example, while significantly decreasing their class of firmicutes, which is associated with fat gain. So there's certain types of bacteria that are associated with gaining fat and these firmicutes. So the saying in health right now is that if you wanna be firm and cute, you gotta reduce the firmicutes, all right? I didn't make that up, somebody else did, all right? But the bottom line is, wow, it has a really powerful, remarkable impact on what's happening with your microbiome. The study also found that it was able to reduce levels of systemic inflammation measured by something called C-reactive protein. And if that weren't enough, Cacao also has these compounds that have a really powerful influence on our mood, like anandamide, which is known, like that translates to mean bliss chemical, right? Uh, serotonin, tryptophan, these precursors that help your body to produce things like melatonin, right? That helps you to sleep better. It goes on and on and on, but the quality matters a lot. And when you can get real chocolate into something that is even more health-giving, you've got something really special. And that's what they have with the new chocolate Organifi Gold Drink. So they've got the chocolate along with their incredible, delicious turmeric formula. And as you know, turmeric has very powerful anti-inflammatory properties. And it also has been clinically proven to have anti-angiogenesis properties. So this means that turmeric literally has the ability to cut off the blood supply to cancer cells, all right? And we all produce cancer cells every day, but a pro properly functioning immune system and being able to regulate this angiogenesis, which we need, but we need at certain levels, is incredibly important, and food can help to regulate that. So I'm a huge fan of Organifi. Now they've got the new chocolate gold. All right, so pop over there, check it out. Just released, just delicious. Organifi.com forward slash model. You get 20% off that and everything else they carry. All right, so head over there, check them out. Organifi.com forward slash model model. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com forward slash model for 20% off. And now back to the show. All right, we're back and we're talking with New York Times bestselling author Max Lubavir about his new book. Got an advanced copy, but you can get yours. It's out now. The Genius Life. It's right here. Make sure to pick up your copy ASAP. And before the break, we're talking about some of the crazy exposure of kind of we're living in a very different world today, a toxic yeah. world. We have a lot of different things that our bodies have not evolved to interact with. And we kind of take it for granted, you know, and just the story about how BPA has evolved and the original intention and just being such this uh, pervasive thing in our culture is crazy, man. So what I want to ask you is, so what are some of the steps we can take to limit our exposure to some of these toxic things that are obviously, like you said, they're having a notable impact on our bodies? Yeah, such a great question. Um, there's there's a lot to cover, but I guess the at a high level, um, try to minimize your, your use of plastic. Um, plastic isn't going anywhere anytime soon. And if I'm dying of thirst at an airport and I don't have a portable, uh, you know, a, a water bottle with me, um, I'll, I'll buy water in a plastic bottle. But to the best of your ability, if you can limit your use of plastic. So... That means drinking out of glass, storing your food in glass or stainless steel. Um, also, not uh, you know any kind of uh, processed food. Like I'm talking about burgers and burritos and pizzas that come in paper wrapping that have a slick, uh, oil-proof side to that paper. You want to make sure to avoid those. 
They use chemicals that are kind of related to like Teflon, which we know is also another um, endocrine disruptor. Those same chemicals are used to create glide uh, dental floss, actually. So um, you want to avoid uh, dental tape or like glide dental floss, um, which you know is sort of marketed as being uh, an easier floss to use because it more easily slides between your teeth. Flossing is, you need to floss. Flossing is great for you, but use more of like a string, you know, like, and they have those at, at any drugstore. Just avoid the dental tape. Um, we already talked about the receipts. You want to avoid using um, or touching receipts uh, to the best of your ability. Um, it's all, all crucial stuff. Um, flame retardants, be aware of flame retardants being used to create your furniture. Um, flame retardants are not necessary to prevent uh, house fires. Actually, the reason why all of our furniture um, or a lot of our furniture and our mattresses are doused in synthetic flame retardant chemicals is because people used to smoke a lot more in the house. Yeah. You know, so literally the whole of, of you know, the U.S. population yeah. has been exposed to these chemicals because people used to like to smoke in their homes. Yeah. And so the tobacco industry, the reason why the why this happened is because there was pressure on them to come up with a solution for the fact that there were all these house fires occurring due to people smoking in their homes, right? And dropping ambers on their couches, their, you know, their lazy boys are in, or on the mattress. Falling asleep with it, with the Siggy. Yeah, with the Siggy. And so what, what did they end up doing? Deflecting blame, putting it on furniture manufacturers, right, right, like right. come up with a solution for this, you guys. And so now we're all exposed to these uh, flame retardant chemicals, which linger in us for years. Interestingly, like BPA, phthalates, parabens, these kinds of compounds, like once you kind of reduce your exposure to them, you pee them out. Your body is an amazing uh, detoxifying, um, has, has all kinds of incredible detoxifying mechanisms. Um, but flame retardant chemicals uh, and, and these Teflon-related chemicals can actually linger for a lot longer. Yeah. Um, so you want to be careful um, to, to just kind of like, you know, if you're on the market for furniture, uh, just be aware of what you're buying. Um, I saw a study recently that uh, this was done on uh, whole kind of base soup, like whole homemade soup and canned soup to see the BPA hmm. interaction that it would happen in the body. And the thing was, of course, like you, they measure urine because it comes out pretty easily, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but what they found was just like a five day study and the folks because in a lot of cans. So you, if you are eating canned food, BPA free would be nice. Uh, but these weren't BPA free because it's like it's in the lining of the inside of the can to help like erosion, that kind of thing. Yeah. But they found after five days, the folks eating the canned soup had over a thousand percent more BPA coming out of their body than the folks who are eating the whole food based soup. Crazy stuff. So, again, we are absorbing it like crazy. But like you said, if you give your body a break, it can eliminate quite a bit of it. Yeah, I think, you know, you want to abide by what I call the three P's of healthy detoxifying, and that is uh, to pee, poop, and perspire. Mm -hmm. So making sure that you're staying hydrated, uh, this is crucial. The solution to pollution is dilution. So making sure that you're staying hydrated, you're peeing clear or, you know, light yellow at the darkest. Um, staying hydrated is crucial. Uh, making sure that you're pooping, you know, like this is something that, you know, I'm sure I don't need to tell you, but there I get a significant... Uh, amount of messages from people that, that are like, you know, I, I don't go to the bathroom every day. I go to the bathroom every other day, maybe sometimes every three days. Uh, so, you know, making sure that you're staying hydrated, which is going to help that, you know, eating a healthful diet, uh, you know, that incorporates lots of produce, fresh produce, fruits and vegetables at the end of the day and movement. I mean, movement is so important. Exercise is so important for digestion. Sean, it's, it's, I mean, it's amazing. Um, so making sure that you're going to the bathroom regularly, uh, and then also perspiring. So, I mean, we release a significant amount of these compounds uh, in our sweat. Maybe not everything, but when you, your skin is a detox organ. So whether it's sitting in a sauna or exercising vigorously, make sure that on a regular basis, I mean, I try to sweat every day. Sometimes I don't hit that goal, you know, but whether it's uh, sitting in a sauna or, um, uh, you know, exercising vigorously. Sometimes I'll even go to the gym and I'll just keep my hoodie on. I'll keep my sweater on to build up my body temperature so that I get a sweat going because I don't actually sweat that easily with exercise. Um, but sweating is is super, super important. So we might catch Max with the bag. Out yeah, on. like the plastic <laughs> bag, the garbage bag. Yeah, I've seen people wear that. I haven't gone that extreme yet. But um, it's like, are you boxing? You know, um, Uncle Jim, he's like 57 years old wearing the, the, the trash bag outfit. Yeah. You see Elliot. 
But hey, I mean, if, again, like that's what I love about you too, man, is that, you know, if it works for you, then it works. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so um, I, I'm really, I, I love this part of the book. And I'd love if you share, first of all, why is peace of mind part of living a genius life in the first place? Yeah, because, you know, we live in stressful times. And, um, you know, I think a lot of us in the health and wellness, you know, community will say, look, stress is, is toxic. You've got to, like, minimize chronic stress as, you know, to the best of your ability. But the reality is, like, we live in a difficult world and, and people sometimes can't necessarily reduce certain stressors in their lives. And so what I like to do is I like to offer people um, both perspective shifts, mindset, mindset shifts, and then also uh, more biological means of boosting their resilience to stress. So whether or not you can actually reduce levels of stress in your life, which I think everybody owes it to themselves to try to do, you can actually um, change the way that you respond to those to those stimuli um, and and how your body responds how your biology responds so I talk about how exercise can make us more resilient one of my favorite actually concepts in the book that I talk about and I don't I haven't seen this in, in other books so I'm really excited to to bring it into the fold for people is this idea of cross adaptation so it's kind of interesting how um, you know Exercise is obviously a form of stress, but it's a really good form of stress. We know that exercise is good for us, right? Sitting in a sauna is a form of stress. Uh, cold water immersion, whether it's taking a cold shower or getting into an ice bath or you know, doing cryo, these are all stressors on the body. Um, but they're actually good forms of stress. What's so cool about this notion of cross-adaptation is that by doing any one of these different modalities, it actually makes us more resilient in other areas of our life. So by exercising more, by sitting in a sauna, by you know, exposing yourself more regularly to cooler temperatures, you actually, your body becomes more resilient, obviously, to those different things. You, know, you, you're, um, you acclimate and you adapt to the, to the uh, workload in your workouts. Um, you're able to spend more time in the sauna or you know, do the cold shower um, for a longer duration, but there's what's called a spillover effect. Mm -hmm where those same modalities are gonna actually boost your resilience to psychological stress. So, I mean, this is an amazing thing. A lot of people feel like they've got their hands tied behind their back with you know, obligations that they have in their lives, uh, maybe financial stress, things like that. But um, you know, I don't offer tips on how to reduce financial stress in the book, but I do offer ways of how to actually bolster your own resilience so that when you are faced with those challenges, which we all are sometimes, you know, that you can actually show up as your best self and uh, not allow it to affect you in a negative way like it does to so many people. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you do that through teaching and, and helping people to optimize their sleep because obviously if you're sleep deprived, it becomes so much more difficult to have peace of mind in the first place. And one of the things you talk about is um, how lack of sleep can increase levels of amyloid plaque. Can you talk a little bit about that and also the tau proteins? Yeah, so plaque is not a good thing. We know it's not good on our teeth. It's certainly not good in our brains. Um, amyloid plaque is uh, a characteristic of, it's a defining characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, you know, our brains, uh, it would be a major um, oversight on behalf of evolution if one third of our time that's spent sleeping was for no reason. But yeah. thankfully, we know, thanks to you know in an incredible bounty of research now coming out, showing us that when we sleep, uh, you know our brains are doing miraculous things from from storing our memories uh, to um, helping us better regulate our emotional health um, to also clearing out these proteins that are associated with. Alzheimer's disease and just more generally aging itself. So we know that on one night of poor sleep, um, levels of amyloid uh, protein and tau, which is another protein that is involved in Alzheimer's disease, um, actually increase to a very dramatic degree. They can look at your cerebrospinal fluid um, and what they find is that on just one night of shortened sleep, levels of amyloid beta actually go up by about 30% and tau go up by 50%. Um, and the thinking is that having a higher concentration of these proteins is basically going to increase the odds that um, more, of it, more of it is going to clump and, uh, and aggregate and form the plaques we associate with Alzheimer's disease. But sleep is also important as a master hormonal regulator. It's important for emotional regulation, as I said, which 
um, can have uh, innumerable downstream effects, right? Because a lot of us eat emotionally. We're emotional eaters. So by optimizing your sleep, um, you can be sure that your hunger levels are going to be kept in check. We know that um, sleep deprivation causes uh, uh, the consumption of an excessive amount of calories the next day, of about 400 uh, additional calories the next day. If you're undersleeping over the course of a week, that's a pound of fat gain right there, just from just from undersleeping. It also makes you temporarily pre-diabetic. Um, so having a being on shortened sleep, you're less insulin sensitive the next day to the tune of having gained overnight 20 to 30 pounds of, of additional weight. So yeah, sleep, you can't really sing its praises enough. And I know that, you know, I mean, you're obviously a, a sleep uh, master. You've written extensively about sleep, but it's one of those things that I think it's, you have to, you have to optimize. Yeah. Um, I use a metaphor in the book. It's sort of like, uh, it's a Game of Thrones metaphor. I'm a big Game of Thrones nerd. And um, in Game of Thrones, you got to kill the Night King so that all of the other zombies fall. You know, you can't beat the zombies until you kill the Night King. And uh, and I think that's kind of like optimizing your sleep is killing the Night King. It's killing the Night King because it's the one thing that if you do right, it's going to make dietary adjustment easier. It's going to help give you more energy in the gym. It's going to help, you know, optimize your executive function so that you can make better decisions um, and have greater a greater sense of impulse control. Um during the day. So yeah, it's, it, it's sort of like the one thing that really helps to optimize all of the other things. Yeah. I love that analogy, man. It's so great. Uh, Max, this has been awesome. And thank you so much for just dropping all these jewels. Uh, I want to make sure everybody picks up a copy of the genius life. So can you let them know where they can find the book? Yeah, for sure. And thank you so much. Uh, genius life book.com. Um, pick it up. It's available now. We'd really be grateful for your support. It's packed with the small things that you can do every day that are going to have big wins on your health and how you feel um, in the short term as well as in the long term. Yeah, man, so good. And you start the book off with a really powerful story. Like it just immediately gripped me hmm. um, before the last time you were on the show, this was a couple of years ago before your mom passed and you share that experience. Um, so how much how much is that experience kind of imbued in you putting this book together? Oh my God. I mean, yeah, my mom, my mom had a very, uh, you know, short life, um, too short. I mean, I'm sure other people have it worse, but my mom suffered immensely in, uh, in brain and body. She had a form of dementia that she was diagnosed with at the age of 58. And, um, you know, she struggled with that for seven years and, and, and seeing her struggle with that really w is the motivation behind all my work. So I didn't come at this as an academic. Um, I came at it as a, you know, from the standpoint of a son who, you know, loves, you know, and continues to love his mother more than anything, you know, on the planet. And she actually, over the course of writing this book, she was, uh, it was Labor Day of 2018. She was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and, um, you know, I hadn't had uh, a family history of dementia. Nobody that I know of in my family had ever had cancer. So trying to understand why my mom developed not one, but two of humanity's most feared conditions, uh, it motivates everything I do. You know, I don't want to get sick. I don't want other people that I love to get sick, other people that I respect to get sick. And so it, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that occurred while I was writing writing the book. And so it's caused me to look at the world in a new way. And I think that we're all just deserving of, of just better, you know? And so if, if my work is able to help one person, then to me, what my mom and we went through wasn't in vain. And, you know, that's, uh, it's just my way of, t of taking something that was incredibly painful and turning it into something that's like, you know, somehow positive. Yeah. Yeah, man. Ah, thank you so much for sharing your story, man. Thank you for um, having the audacity to dive into the research. I know this could be murky waters, you know, and putting this together for everybody in a way that makes sense, in a way that's enjoyable to read. And man, it's just like, there's certain people, it's just like, there's so much good stuff that's still going to be coming from you. And I can't wait to see what you do next. And uh, I want to make sure that everybody else who's continue to stay connected with you. Not only are you a prolific writer, but also you've got a top podcast as well. 
Yeah, my podcast is called The Genius Life. So if you listen to podcasts, come over, um, say hi, hit the subscribe button. Uh, I've had you on it, and I'm looking forward to having you on it again. Um, you're one of my favorite people to chat with, so I'm looking forward to that. And then I'm also super active on Instagram, and uh, my Instagram handle is at Max Lugavere, L-U-G-A-V-E-R-E. Dope. The Night Kings, take them out. Yeah, take them out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for hanging out with me, man. Thanks, John. It means a lot. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into the show today. I hope you got a lot of value out of this. Make sure to pick up Max's new book, The Genius Life, right now. Get yourself a new copy. And listen, um, again, this is, I love the fact that he went from the focus on food to overall life and the, all the different dynamics that create an overall healthy life or what Max calls a genius life. You know, looking at our movement practices, looking at our nutrition, of course, looking at our sleep, but also looking at how we're relating to the world around us, right? The uh, beneficial exposures and the not so beneficial exposures, all these things create this overall picture of health and wellness for us. So uh, just pointing a, a very intelligent lens at it and diving into the research, giving us the facts is what I really respect about Max and his writing. So uh, again, definitely pick up a copy. And I appreciate you so much for tuning into the show. If you've got a lot of value out of this, make sure to share this out with the people that you care about. You could tag me and tag Max and let him know what you thought about the episode as well. And I appreciate you so much. We've got some epic episodes coming your way very soon. So make sure to stay tuned. Take care, have an amazing day, and I'll talk with you soon. Mm -hmm.